Hello, and we're here at theCUBE's Startup Showcase made possible by AWS. Thanks so much for joining us today. You know, when Jamak Deghani was formulating her ideas around data mesh, she wasn't the only one thinking about decentralized data architectures. HelloFresh was going into hyper growth mode and realized that in order to support its scale, it needed to rethink how it thought about data. Like many companies that started in the early part of last decade, HelloFresh relied on a monolithic data architecture and the internal team had had concerns about its ability to support continued innovation at high velocity. The company's data team began to think about the future and work backwards from a target architecture which possessed many principles of so-called data mesh, even though they didn't use that term specifically. The company is a strong example of an early but practical pioneer of data mesh. Now there are many practitioners and stakeholders involved in evolving the company's data architecture, many of whom are listed here on this, on this slide. Two are highlighted in red are joining us today. We're really excited to welcome into theCUBE Clements Chi, who's the Global Senior Director for Data at HelloFresh, and Christoph Zavada, who's the Global Senior Director of Data, also of course at HelloFresh. Folks, welcome. Thanks so much for making some time today and sharing your story. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. All right, let's start with HelloFresh. You guys are number one in the world in your field. You deliver hundreds of millions of meals each year to many, many millions of people around the globe. You're scaling. Christoph, tell us a little bit more about your company and its vision. Yeah, um, should I start or Clemens? Maybe, maybe take over the first piece because uh, Clemens has actually been a longer trajectory at HelloFresh. Yeah, go ahead, Clemens, sure please. I mean, yes, about um, approximately six years ago, I joined HelloFresh and I didn't think about the startup I was joining would eventually IPO. And just two years later, HelloFresh went public. And approximately three years and 10 months after HelloFresh was listed on the German stock exchange, which was just last week, HelloFresh was included in the DAX, Germany's leading stock market index. And that determined a great, great milestone. And I'm really looking forward and I'm very excited for the future, for the future for HelloFresh and also our data. Um, the vision that we have is to become the world's leading food solution group. And there's a lot of attractive opportunities. So recently uh, we did launch and expand um, in Norway. This was in July. And earlier this year, we launched the US brand uh, Green Chef in the UK as well. We're committed to launch continuously different geographies um, in the next coming years and have a strong pipeline ahead of us. With the acquisition of ready to eat companies like Factor in the US and the planned acquisition of U Foods in Australia, we are diversifying our offer and are reaching even more and more untapped customer segments and increase our total addressable market. So by offering customers and growing range of different alternatives to shop food and consume meals, we are charging towards this vision and this goal to become the world's leading integrated food solutions group. Love it, you guys are on a rocket ship. Uh, you're really transforming the industry. And as you expand your TAM, it brings us to sort of the data as a, as a core part of that strategy. So maybe you guys could talk a little bit about your journey as a company, specifically as it relates to your data journey. I mean, you, you, you began as a startup, you had a basic architecture and like everyone, you, you made extensive use of sp spreadsheets. You built a Hadoop based system that started to grow. And when the company IPO, you really started to explode. So maybe describe that journey from a data perspective. Yes, Dave, so HelloFresh by 2015 approximately had evolved what amount a classical centralized data management setup. So we grew very organically over the years and there were a lot of very smart people around the globe really building the company and building our infrastructure. Um, this also means that there were a small number of internal and external sources, data sources, and a centralized BI team with a number of people producing different reports, different dashboards and, and products for our um, executives, for example, of our different operations teams to steer company's performance. And knowledge was transferred um, just via talking to each other, face-to-face -face conversations, and the people in the data warehouse team were considered as the data wizard or as the ETL wizard, um, very classical challenges. And those ETL wizards indicated the 
kind of like a silent knowledge of data management, right? Um, so a central data warehouse team then was responsible for different type of verticals and different domains, different geographies, and all this setup gave us in the beginning the flexibility to grow fast as a company in 2015. Christoph, anything you um, might add to that? Yes, um, not explicitly to that one, but as, as Clement has said, right, this was kind of the setup uh, that actually worked for us quite a while. And then in 2017, uh, when HelloFresh went uh, public, the company also grew rapidly. And just to give you an idea how that looked like, it was that the tech department itself actually increased from about 40 people to almost 300 engineers. And in the same way, the business units, as Clemens has described, also grew sustain sustainably. So we continuously launched HelloFresh in new countries, launched new brands like Everplate, and also acquired other brands like Green Chef and Factor. And with that growth, also from a data perspective, the number of data requests that the central meeting were, were getting become more and more and more, and also more and more complex. So that for the team meant that they had a fairly high mental load. So they had to achieve a very, or basically get a very deep understanding about the business and also suffered a lot from this context switching back and forth. Essentially, they had to prioritize across our product uh, requests from our physical product, digital product, from the physical, uh, from sorry, from the marketing perspective, and also from the central uh, reporting uh, uh, teams. And in a nutshell, this was very hard for these people. And this led also to a situation that, let's say, the, the solution that we have built became not really uh, optimal. So in a, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, the central function became a bottleneck and slowdown of all the innovation of the company. I mean, it's a classic case, is, isn't it? I mean, Clements, you, you, see, you see the central team becomes a bottleneck and so the lines of business, the marketing team, sales team, say, okay, we're going to take things into our own hands. And then of course, I, IT and the technical team is called in later to clean up the mess. So <laughs> maybe, yeah. I mean, was that, maybe I'm overstating it, but, but that's a common situation, isn't it? Uh, Dave, this is what exactly happened, right? So um, we had a bottleneck, we had those central teams, there was always a little bit of tension. Um, analytics teams then started uh, in, in those business domains like uh, marketing, supply chain, finance, HR, and so on, started really to build their own data solutions. At some point you have to get the ball uh, rolling, right? And then continue the trajectory, um, which means then that the data pipelines didn't meet the engineering standards and um, there was an increased need for maintenance and support from central teams. Um, hence, over time, the knowledge about those pipelines and um, how to maintain a particular uh, infrastructure, for example, left the company, such that uh, most of those data assets and uh, data sets are turned into a, a huge debt with decreasing data quality, um, also decreasing lack of trust, decreasing transparency. And this was a increasing challenge where majority of time was spent in meeting rooms to align on, on data quality, for example. Yeah, and, and the point you were making, Christoph, about context switching, and this is this is a point that Jamak makes quite often, is we've, op, we've, we've contextualized our operational systems, like our sales systems, our marketing systems, but not our, our data systems. So you're asking the data team, okay, be an expert in sales, be an expert in marketing, be an expert in logistics, be an expert in supply chain. And it starts, stop, start, stop. It's a paper cut environment and it's just not uh, as productive. But, but and, and the flip side of that is when you think about a centralized organization, you think, hey, this is going to be a very efficient way across functional team to support the organization, but it, it's not necessarily the highest velocity, most effective organizational structure. Yeah, so, so I agree with that piece that uh, to up to a certain scale, a centralized function has a lot of advantages, right? So it's clear for everyone who to go to, uh, there's some kind of expert team. However, if you see that you actually would like to accelerate that and specific in the cyber growth, right? You want to actually have autonomy in certain teams and move the teams to, or let's say the data to the experts in these teams. And this, as you have mentioned, right? That increases mental load and you can either internally start splitting your team into different kind of sub teams, focusing on different areas. However, well, that is then again, just adding another piece where actually collaboration needs to happen with the external seas. So why not bridging that gap immediately and actually move these teams end to end into, into the function themselves. So maybe just to continue what, what, what Clemens was saying, and this is actually where our, so 
Clemens my uh, journey started uh, to become one joint journey. So Clemens was coming actually from one of these teams who build their own solutions. I was basically heading the, the platform team called data warehouse team these days. And in 2019, where basically the, the situation become more and more serious, I would say. So more and more people have recognized that this model does not really scale. In 2019, uh, basically the leadership of the company came together and identified data as a key strategic asset. And what we mean by that, that if we leverage data in a, in, a, in a proper way, it gives us a unique competitive advantage, which could help us to, to support and actually fully automate our decision-making process across the entire value chain. So what, we, what we're trying to do now, or what, we, what we're aiming for is that HelloFresh is able to build data products that have a purpose. We're moving away from the idea data is just a byproduct product. So we have a purpose why we would like to collect this data. There's a clear business need behind that. And because it's so important to uh, for the company as a, as a business, we also want to provide them as a trustworthy asset to the rest of the organization. We say there's the best customer experience, but at least in a way that the users can easily discover, understand, and securely access high quality data. Yeah. So and 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 Clements, when you see Jamak's writing, you see, you know, she has the four pillars and and the principles. As practitioners, you look at that and say, okay, hey, that's pretty good thinking. And then now we have to apply it. And that's, and that's where the, the devil meets the, the details. So it's the, the four, you know, the, the, the decentralized data ownership, data as a product, which we'll talk about a little bit, self-serve, which you guys have spent a lot of time on, and Clements, your wheelhouse, which is, which is governance and a federated governance model. And, it, and it's almost like if you, if you achieve the first two, then you have to solve for the second two. It almost creates a new challenges, but maybe you could talk about that a little bit as to how it relates to, to HelloFresh. Yes, so Christoph mentioned that we identified kind of a challenge beforehand and thought how can we actually decentralize and actually um, empower the different uh, colleagues of ours. Um, this was more a, we realized that it was more an organizational or a, a, a culture change. And this is something that, Samak also mentioned, um, I think ThoughtWorks mentioned it on, on one of the white papers, it's more of a organizational or a cultural impact. And we kicked off a um, phased reorganization or different phases. We're currently in, um, in the middle still, but we kicked off different phases of organizational um, re reconstructing or reorganization to unlock this data at scale. And the idea was really moving away from um, ever growing complex matrix organizations or matrix setups and split between two different things. One is the value creation. So basically when people ask the question, what can we actually do? What shall we do? This is value creation and the how, which is capability building and both are equal in authority. This actually then creates a high urge in collaboration and this collaboration breaks up the different silos that were built. And of course, this also includes different needs of staffing for our teams, staffing with more, let's say, data scientists or uh, data engineers, data professionals into those business domains, and hence also more capability building. Um, oh, okay, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. So back to Zamak uh, Digani. So we, the idea also then crossed over when she uh, published her papers in, in May, 2019. And we thought, well, the four pillars that she described um, were around decentralized data ownership, uh, product data as a product mindset. We have a self-service infrastructure, and as you mentioned, federated computational governance. And this suited very much with our thinking at that point of time to reorganize the different teams. And this then led to a not only organizational restructure, but also a completely new approach of how we need to manage data to data. Got it, okay. So your business is, is exploding. Your data to, to, to team was have to become domain experts in too many areas. you constantly context switching, as we said. People started to take things into their own hands. So again, we said classic story, but but you didn't let it get out of control and that's important. And so we, we actually have a, a picture of kind of where you're going today and it's evolved into this pad. If you could bring up the, the, the picture with the, the elephant, here we go. So I, I would talk a little bit about the architecture. It doesn't show it here, the, the spreadsheet era, but Christoph, maybe you can talk about that. It does show the Hadoop monolith, which exists today. 
I think that's in a managed managed uh, hosting service. But but you you preserve that piece of it. But if I understand it correctly, everything is evolving to the cloud. I think you're running a lot of this or all of it in AWS. Uh, you've got everybody's got their own data sources. Uh, you've got a data hub, which I think is enabled by a master catalog for discovery and all this underlying technical infrastructure that is, is really not the focus of this conversation today. But the key here, if I understand it correctly, is these domains are autonomous. And that not only the re the, this required technical thinking, but really supportive organizational mindset, which we're going to talk about today. But, but Christoph, maybe you could address you know, at a high level, some of the architectural evolution that you guys went through. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, maybe it's also a good summary about the entire history. So as you have mentioned, right, we started uh, in the very beginning uh, with a monolith on the operational plane, right? Actually, it wasn't just one uh, monolith, it was two, one for the back end and one for the, for the front end. And our analytical plane was uh, essentially a couple of spreadsheets. And I think there's nothing wrong with spreadsheets, right? This allows you to store information, it allows you to transform data, it allows you to share this information, it allows you to visualize this data, but all kind of without actually separating concern, right? Everything in one tool. And this means that it's obviously not scalable, right? You reach the point where this kind of management setup in, in, in or data management within one tool reach the limits. So what we have started is we created our data lake, as we have seen here on, a, on Hadoop. And this, in the very beginning, actually reflected very much our operational model. Uh, on top of that, we used Impala as a data warehouse, but there was not really a distinction between what is our data warehouse and what is our data lake. So the Impala was used as kind of both as a kind of engine to create a data warehouse and data lake construct itself. And this organic growth actually led to a situation, as I think it's it's clear now, that we had a centralized model list for all the domains. There were really loose Kimball modeling standards. There was no uniformity. We used actually build uh, in-house uh, base of building materialized use uh, views that we have used for the presentation layer. There was a lot of duplication of effort, and in the in the end, essentially, there were missing feedback loops, which helped us to to improve of what we have built. So in the end, in a nutshell, as you have said, the lack of, uh, of trust, and this basically was a starting point for us to understand, okay, how can we move away? And there are a lot of different things that we can discuss of. Apart from this organizational structure that we have said, okay, we have these three or four pillars from, from Jamak. However, there's also the next actually question around how do we implement our target architecture, right? What are the implications on that level? And I think that is that is something that we are that we are currently still in progress. Got it. Okay, so I wonder if we could talk about switch gears a little bit and talk about the organizational uh, and cultural challenges that, that you faced. What were those conversations like? Uh, and then let's, let's dig into that a little bit. I want to get into governance as, as well. The conversations on the cultural change. I mean, yes, we, we went through a hyper growth through the last years. And obviously there were a lot of new joiners, um, a lot of different, uh, very, very smart people joining the, the company, which then results that collaboration uh, got a bit more difficult, of course. Um, we have time zone changes. You have different uh, different artifacts that new were, were created, um, and documentation that were flying around. Um, so we were we we had to build the company from scratch, right? Um, of course, this then resulted always in this tension, which I described before. But the most important part here is that data has always been a very important factor at HelloFresh, and um, we collected more of this data and continued to improve, use data to improve the different key areas of our business. Um, even when organizational uh, struggles, like the central organizational struggles, um, data somehow always helped us to, to go through this, this kind of change, right? Um, in the end, those decentralized teams in our local geographies started with solutions that serve the business which was very, very important. Otherwise we wouldn't be at the place where we are today, but they did violate best practices and standards. And I always use the sport analogy, Dave. So like any sport, there are different rules and regulations that need to be followed. These rules are defined by, call it the sports association. And this is what you can think about of a data governance and data compliance team. Now we add the players to it who need to follow those rules and um, bite by them. This is what we then call data management. 
Now we have the different players, the professionals, they always need to be trained and understand the strategy and the rules before they can play. And this is what I then call data literacy. So we realized that we need to focus on helping our teams to develop those capabilities and teach the standards for how work is being done to truly drive functional excellence in the different domains. And one of our mission of our data literacy program, for example, is to really empower every employee at HelloFresh, everyone, to make the right data informed decisions by providing data education that scales by role and team. And this can be different things, different things like including data capabilities um, with in the learning paths, for example, right? So help them to create and deploy data products, connecting data producers and data consumers and create a common sense and more understanding of each other's dependencies, which is important for example, SLAs, SLOs, data contracts, and et cetera. Um, people get a more of a sense of ownership and responsibility. Of course, we have to define what it means. What does ownership means? What does responsibility mean? But we're teaching this to our colleagues via individual learning paths and help them upskill to use also the shared infrastructure and those self-service self data applications. And overall, to summarize, we are still in this progress of, of, of learning. We're still learning as well. So learning never stops at HelloFresh, but we are really trying this um, to make it as much fun as possible. And in the end, we all know user behavior has changed through positive experience. Uh, so instead of having massive training programs over endless courses of workshops, um, leaving our new journalists and colleagues confused and overwhelmed, we're applying um, gamification, right? So split different levels of certification where our colleagues can access, uh, have, have access points, they can earn badges along the way, which then simplifies the process of learning and engagement of the users. And this is what we see in surveys, for example, where our employees value this gamification approach a lot and are even competing to collect those learning path badges to become the number one on the leaderboard. I, I love the gamification. I mean, we've seen it work so well in so many different industries, not the least of which is, is crypto. So you've identified some of the process gaps uh, uh, that, that you, you saw. You didn't just gloss over them. Sometimes I say pave the cow path. You didn't try to force, in other words, a new architecture into the legacy processes. You really had to rethink your approach to, to data management. So what, what did that entail? Um, to rethink the way of data management, if 100%. So if I take the example of um, revolution, industrial revolution or classical supply chain revolution, right? So just imagine that you have um, been riding a horse, for example, your whole life, and suddenly you can operate a car or you suddenly receive just a complete new way of transporting assets from A to B. Um, so we needed to establish a new set of cross-functional business processes to run faster, drive faster, um, more robustly and deliver data products which can be trusted and used by downstream processes and systems. Hence, we had a subset of um, new standards and new procedures that would fall into the internal data governance and compliance sector. With internal, I'm always referring to the data operations um, around new things like data catalog, um, how to identify ownership, how to change ownership, how to certify data assets, everything around classical software development, um, which we now apply to, to data. This, this is somehow a, a new thinking, right? Um, deployment, versioning, QA, all the different things, ingestion policies, deletion procedures, all the things that software development has been doing um, we do it now with data as well. And in simple terms, it's a whole redesign of the supply chain of our data with new procedures and new processes in asset creation, asset management, and asset consumption. So, so data has become kind of the new development kit, if you will. Um, I want to shift gears and talk about the notion of, of data product. And, and we have a slide uh, that, that we pulled from your deck and I'd like to unpack it a little bit. Um, if, I'll just, if you could bring that up, I'll, I'll read it. A data product is a product whose primary objective is to leverage on data to solve customer problems, where customer is both internal and external. So pretty straightforward. I know you've, you've gone much deeper in your thinking and into your organization, but how do you think about that 
And how do you determine, for instance, who owns what? How did you get everybody to agree? I can take that one. Um, maybe let me start with the data product. So I think um, that's an ongoing debate, right? And I think the debate itself is the important piece here, right? That uh, within the debate, you clarify what we actually mean by data product and what is actually the mindset. So I think just from a definition perspective, right? I think we find the common denominator that we say, okay, data product is something which is important for the company, it comes with value. What we mean by that, okay, it's, it's a solution to a customer problem that it delivers ideally maximum value to the business. And yes, it leverages the power of data. And we have a couple of examples by Ed HelloFresh here, the historical and classical ones around dashboards, for example, to monitor our error rates, but also more sophisticated ways, for example, uh, to incorporate machine learning algorithms in our recipe recommendation. However, I think the important aspects of a data product is A, there's an owner, right? There's someone accountable for making sure that the product that we are providing is actually served and is maintained and uh, there are there's someone who's making sure that this actually keeps the value that we are promising combined with the idea of the proper documentation like a product description right that people understand how to use it what is this about and related to that piece is the idea of it, it is a purpose right we need to understand or ask ourselves okay why does this thing exist does it provide the value that we think it does that leads then to a good understanding about the life cycle of the data product and Product life cycle, what we mean, okay, from the beginning, from the creation, we need to have a good understanding, we need to collect feedback, we need to learn about that, we need to rework, and actually finally also to think about, okay, when is it time to decommission that piece? So overall, I think the core of this data product is product thinking 101, right? That we start, the point, the starting point needs to be the problem and not the solution. And this is essentially what we have seen, what was missing, um, what brought us to this kind of data spaghetti that we have built where in, in rush, essentially, we build certain data assets, develop in isolation, and continuously patch the solution just to fulfill these ad hoc requests that we, we, we got, and actually without really understanding what the stakeholder needs. And the interesting piece is it results in duplication of work, and this is not just frustrating and probably not the most efficient way how the company should work, but also if I build the same data assets with slightly different assumption across the company and multiple teams that leads to data inconsistency. And imagine the following scenario, you as a management, uh, from management perspective, you're asking basically a specific question and you get essentially from a couple of different teams, different kind of graphs, different kind of data and numbers. And in the end, you do not know which one to trust. So there's actually much more ambiguity and you do not know actually, is it noise what I'm observing or is it just actually is there actually a signal that I'm looking for? And the same is if I'm running an A-B test, right? Uh, I have a new feature. I would like to understand what is the business impact of this feature. I run that with a specific source. In an unfortunate scenario, your production system is actually running on a different source. You see different numbers. What you have seen in A-B test is actually not what you see then in production. Typical thing then is you're asking some analytics team to actually do a deep dive to understand where the discrepancies are coming from. Worst case scenario, again, with a different kind of source. So in the end, it's a pretty frustrating scenario and it's actually a waste of time of people that have to identify the root cause of this di divergence. So in a nutshell, the highest degree of consistency is actually achieved if people are just reusing data assets. And also in the, in the meetup talk that we have given, right, we, we start, try to establish this approach for A-B testing. So we have a team which is providing uh, or is kind of owning their target metric associated with these teams and they're providing that as a product also to other services, including the A-B testing team. The A-B testing team can use this information, defines an interface, says, okay, I am joining this information with the metadata of an experiment. And in the end, after the assignment, after this uh, data collection phase, they, you can easily add a graph to your dashboard just grouped by the A-B testing variant. And we have seen that also uh, in other companies. So it's not just a nice dream that we have, right? I have actually worked in other companies where we worked on search and we established KPI, a complete KPI uh, pipeline that was computing all this information. And this information was hosted by that team and it was used for everything, A-B testing, deep dives and, and regular reporting. Yeah. So but to, oh God, just, just one last second, the, the important piece now why I'm coming back to that is that requires that we are treating this data as a product, right? If we want to have multiple people using the thing that I'm owning and building, we have to provide this as a trustworthy asset and in a way that it's easy for people to discover and actually work with. 
Yeah, and coming back to that, so this is, to me, this is why I get so excited about Data Mesh because I really do think it's the right direction for organizations. When people hear data product, they think, well, what does that mean? Uh, but then when you start to sort of define it as you did, it's, it's, it's using data to add value. That could be cutting costs, that could be generating revenue, it could be actually directly you know, creating a product that you monetize. So it, it, it's sort of in the eyes of the beholder. But I think the other point that we've made is, is you made it earlier on too, and, and again, context. So when you have a centralized data team and you have all these P&L managers, a lot of times they'll question the data because they don't own it. They're like, well, wait a minute. If, they don't, if it doesn't agree with their agenda, they'll attack the data. But if they own the data, then they're responsible for defending that. And that is a, a, a mindset change that's really important. Um, and I'm curious, uh, uh, is how you got to, you know, that ownership. Was it a, was it a top down? Was somebody providing leadership? Was it more organic, bottom up? Was it a sort of a combination? How do you decide who owned what? In other words, yeah. you know, did, did 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 you get? How did you get the business to take ownership of the data? And what does owning, you know, the data actually mean? That's a very good question, Dave. I think that is one of the pieces where I think we have a lot of learnings and basically if you ask me how we would start differently, I think that would be the first piece where we, where we need to start really think about how that should be approached. If it starts with ownership, right, it means somehow that the team has the responsibility to host and serve the data assets to minimum acceptable standards with minimal dependencies up and downstream. The interesting piece is we're looking backwards what was happening is that under that definition, this actually process that we have to go through is not actually transferring ownership from a central team to the distributed teams, but actually in most cases to establish ownership. I make this difference because saying we have to uh, transfer ownership actually would erroneously suggest that the data set was owned before. But this platform team, yes, they had the capability to make the changes on data pipelines, but actually the analytics team were always the ones who had the business understanding the use cases and were known actually what was actually expected. So we had to go through this very lengthy process and establishing ownership and how we have done that as in the beginning, very naively, we have started, here's a document, here are all the data assets. What is probably the, the, the nearest neighbor who can actually take care of that? And then we, we moved it over. But the problem here is that all these things is kind of technical debt, right? It's, it's not really properly documented, it's pretty unstable. It was built in a very inconsistent way over years. And these people who have built this thing have already left the company. So this is actually not a nice thing that you, that you want to see. And people build up a certain resistance here, even if they have actually bought into this idea of domain ownership. So if you ask me these learnings, what, what needs to happen is first, the company needs to really understand what are our core business concepts that we have. They need to have this mapping from these are the core business concepts that we have. These are the domain teams who are owning this concept and then actually link that to the, to the assets and integrate that better with both understanding how we can evolve actually the data assets and new data build things new in the, in this piece and in, in the domain, but also how can we address reduction of technical debt and stabilizing what we have already. Thank you for that, Christoph. So I want to turn uh, a direction here and talk, Clemens, uh, about governance. And I know that's an area that's passionate, you're passionate about. Uh, I pulled this slide uh, from your deck, which I kind of messed up a little bit, sorry for that. But, but, uh, but by the way, we're going to publish a link to the full video that you guys did. So we'll share that with folks. But it's one of the most challenging aspects of data mesh. If you're going to decentralize, uh, you, you quickly realize this could be the wild west as we talked about all over again. So how are you approaching governance? There's a lot of items on this slide that are, you know, underscore the complexity, whether it's privacy, compliance, et cetera. So, so how did you approach this? It's, yeah, it's about connecting those dots, right? So the aim of the data governance program is to promote uh, the autonomy of every team while still ensuring that everybody has the right interoperability. So when we want to move from the Wild West, uh, riding horses to a civilized way of transport, um, I can take the example of modern street traffic, like when all participants can maneuver independently and as long as they follow the same rules and standards, everybody can remain compatible with each other and understand and learn from each other so we can avoid car crashes. So when I go from country to country, I do understand what the street infrastructure means how do I drive my car? I can also read the traffic lights and the different signals. Um, so likewise, as a business in HelloFresh, we do operate autonomously. 
and consequently need to follow those external and internal rules and standards to set forth by the jurisdiction in which we operate. So in order to prevent a, a car crash, we need to at least ensure compliance with regulations to account for societies and our customers increasing concern with data protection and privacy. So teaching and advocating this and evangelizing this to everyone in the company um, was a key community a communication strategy. And of course, I mean, I mentioned uh, data privacy, external factors, the same goes for internal regulations and processes to help our colleagues to adapt to this very new environment. So when I mentioned before, the new way of thinking, the new way of um, dealing and managing data, this of course implies that we need new processes and regulations for our colleagues as well. Um, in a nutshell, then, this means that data governance provides a framework for managing our people, um, the processes and technology and culture around our data traffic. And those components must come together in order to have this effective program, providing at least a common denominator is especially critical for shared data as such, which we have across our different um, geographies manage and shared applications on shared infrastructure and, and applications and is then consumed by centralized processes um, for example master data everything and all the metrics and kpis which are also used for a central uh, steering um, it's a big change dave right and our ultimate goal is to have this non-invasive federated um, automated and computational governance and for that, we can't just talk about it. We actually have to go deep and use case by use case and POC by POC and generate learnings and learnings with the different teams. And this would be a classical approach of identifying the target um, structure, the target status, match it with the current status by identifying together with the business teams with the different domains, um, have a risk assessment, for example, to increase transparency because a lot of teams they might not even know what kind of situation they might be and this is where this training and this piece of data literacy comes into place where we go in and create based on the findings based on the most valuable use case um, and based on that help our teams to to do this change to increase um, their capability right so a little bit more I wouldn't say hand-holding, but a lot of guidance. Clemens, um, can I can, yeah. I can I chime in quickly? Yeah, um, Dave, if you allow me. I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, governance piece, right? I think um, that is important. And if you're talking about documentation, for example, yes, we can go from team to team and tell these people, hey, you have to document your data assets and data catalog, or you have to establish a data uh, contract and so on and forth. But if we would like to build data products at scale, following actual governance, we need to think about automation, right? We need to think about a lot of things that we can learn from engineering before. And this starts with simple things like if we would like to build up trust in our data products, right? And actually want to apply the same rigor and the best practices that we know from engineering, there are things that we can do and we should probably think about what we can copy. And one example might be service level, service level agreements, service level objectives, service level indicators, right? That represent on, a, on an engineering level, right? If you're providing services, they're representing the promises we make to our customer and to our consumers. These are the internal objectives that help us to keep those promises. And actually these are the, the way of how we are tracking ourselves, how we are doing. And this is just one example where I think the federated govern, uh, uh, governance comes into play, right? In an ideal world, we should not just talk about data as a product, but also data product as code that we say, okay, as most as much as possible, right? Give the engineers the tools that they are familiar with and actually not ask the product managers, for example, to document their data assets in a data catalog, but make it part of the configuration. Have this as a, as a CD, CI uh, continuous delivery pipeline as we, as we typically see in other engineering uh, tasks through and services where we say, okay, there is configuration. We can think about PII, we can think about data quality monitoring. We can think about um, the ingestion in data catalog and so on and forth. But I think ideally in a data product world, we come up with certain templates that can be deployed and are actually rejected or verified at build time before we actually make them uh, deploy them to production. Yeah, so it's like DevOps yes. for data product. Uh, um, so, so I'm envisioning almost a three-phase approach to governance, and you kind of—it sounds like you're in the early phase. We call it phase zero, where 
there's, there's learning, there's literacy, there's training, education, there's kind of self-governance, and then there's some kind of oversight, some, a lot of manual stuff going on. And then you, you're trying to process builders at this phase, and then you codify it, and, and then you can automate it. Is that fair? Yeah, I would rather think think about automation as early as possible in a way. And yes, there needs to be certain rules, but then actually start actual use case by use case. Is there anything that a small piece that we can already uh, automate? If this is possible, roll that out and then actually extend it step by step. Is there a role though that adjudicates that? Is there a central, you know, chief data officer who's responsible for making sure people are complying or is it, how do you handle that? I mean, from a, from a, from a, uh, Platform perspective, yes, we have a centralized team to uh, implement certain pieces that we think uh, are important and actually would like to implement. However, that is actually working very closely with the governance department, so it's Clement's piece, to understand and define the policies that needs to be implemented. So, so Clements, essentially it's, it's, it's your responsibility to make sure that the policy is being followed. And then, as you were saying, Christoph, try to compress the time to automation as fast as possible. Is that is 100%. that percent? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. So it's a really it's a what needs to be really clear is that it's a, always a split effort, right? So you, you can't just do one thing or the other thing, but everything really goes hand in hand because for the right automation, for the right engineering tooling, we need to have the transparency first. And I mean, code needs to be coded, so we kind of need to operate on the same level with the right understanding. So there's actually two things that are important, which is one, it's policies and guidelines, but not only that, because more importantly, or even well, equally important, is to align with the end user and the tech teams and engineering, and really bridge between business value, business teams and the engineering teams. Got it. So just a couple more questions, because we got to wrap. I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the business outcome. I know it's hard to quantify, and it's, I'll talk about that in a moment, but. But major learnings, we've got some of the challenges that, that you cited, I'll just put them up here. We don't have to go detailed in, uh, into this, but I just wanted to share with some folks. But my question, I mean, this is the advice for your peers question. If you had to do it differently, if you had a do-over or a mulligan, as we like to say for you golfers, what would you do differently? Um, I mean, I, I can maybe start with from, a, from the transformational challenge that understanding that it's also a high load of cultural change. I think this is this is important that um, a particular communication strategy needs to be put into place and people really need to be um, supported, right? So it's not that we go in and say, well, we have to change into a, towards data mesh, um, but naturally it's in the human nat nature, you know, we are kind of resistant to, to change, right? Um, because we feel uncomfortable. So we need to take that away by training and by communicating. Um, Chris, do you want to add something to that? Um, definitely. I think the point that I've also made before, right? We need to acknowledge that data mesh is an architecture of scale, right? We're looking for something which is necessary by huge companies who want to build data products at scale. Um, I mean, Dave, you mentioned that, right? There are a lot of advantages to have a centralized team, but at some point it may make sense to actually decentralize here. And at this point, right, if you think about data mesh, you have to recognize that you're not building something on a green field. And I think there's a big learning, which is also reflected here on the slide is don't underestimate your baggage. It's Typically, you, you come to a point where the old model didn't, doesn't work anymore. And as head of fresh, right, we lost our, the trust in our data and actually we, we have seen certain risks that we are slowing down our innovation. So we triggered that, need, this was triggering the need to actually change something. So but this transition implies that you typically have a lot of de technical debt accumulated over years. And I think what we have learned is that potentially we have decentralized some assets too early. This is not actually uh, taking into account the maturity of the team where we are actually distributing to. And now we're actually in the phase of correcting pieces of that one, right? But I think if you if you, if you you start from scratch, you have to understand, okay, is are my teams actually ready for taking on this new, uh, this new capability? And you have to make sure that this is decentralization. You build up these capabilities in the teams. And as Clemens has mentioned, right? Make sure that you take the, the people on your journey. Um, I think these are the pieces that also here it comes with this knowledge gap, right? That we need to think about hiring and literacy, the technical depth I, I just talked about. And I think 
The, the last piece that I would add now, which is not here on the slide deck is also from our perspective, we started on the analytical layer because this is kind of where things are exploding, right? This is the thing where people feel the pain. But I think a lot of the efforts that we have started to actually modernize the current state uh, and towards data product, towards data mesh, we have understood that it always comes down basically to a proper shape of our operational plane. And I think what needs to happen is, is I think we got through a lot of pains, but the learning here is, is needs to really be an, a commitment from the company and needs to happen end to end. I think that point, that last point you made is so critical because I, I, I hear a lot from the vendor community about how they're going to make analytics better. And that's not, that's not unimportant, but, but true data product thinking and decentralized data organizations uh, really have to operationalize in order to scale. So these decisions around data architecture and organization, they're fundamental and lasting. It's you know, not necessarily about an individual project ROI. They're going to be projects, sub projects, you know, within this architecture, but the architectural decision itself is organizational, it's cultural, and, and what's the best approach to support your business at scale. It really speaks to, to, to what you are, who you are as a company, how you operate, and getting that right, as we've seen yeah. in the success of data-driven companies is yields tremendous results. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask each of you to give, a, give us your final thoughts and then we'll wrap. Maybe, maybe uh, Christoph. Dave, can I quickly, please. Yeah, maybe ju just, just jumping on this piece what you have mentioned, right? The target architecture, if we talk about these pieces, right? People often have this picture in mind, like, okay, there are different kinds of stages. We have sources, we have actually an ingestion layer, we have a storage layer, transformation layer, and presentation layer, and then we are basically putting a lot of technology on top of that, that's kind of our target architecture. However, I think what we really need to make sure is that we have these different kind of views, right? We need to understand what are actually the capabilities that we need in our new world, how does it look and feel from the different kind of personas to so an experience view? And then finally, that should actually go to the to the target architecture from a technical perspective. Um, maybe just to give an outlook, what what we are what we are planning to to do, how we want to move that forward. We have actually based on our strategy in the in the sense of we would like to increase data maturity as a whole across the entire company. And this is kind of a framework around the business strategy. And it's breaking down into four pillars. This is about people, meaning the data culture, data literacy, data organizational structure, and so on. Then we're talking about governance, as uh, Clemens has actually mentioned that, right? Compliance, governance, data management, and so on. We talk about technology, and I think we uh, could uh, talk for hours for that one. It's around data platform, data science platform. And then finally, also about enablement through data, meaning we need to understand data quality, data accessibility, and applied science and data monetization. Great, uh, thank you, Christoph. Clements, why don't you bring us home? Give us your final thoughts. I can't, I can just uh, agree with Christoph uh, that uh, important is to understand what kind of maturity people have, right? understand what at the maturity level where um, a company or at, where, where people, the like organization is, and really understand what does Kind of such kind of a change implies to that those four pillars, for example, um, what needs to be tackled first. And this is not very clear from the very first beginning, because um, it's kind of like green field. You come up with must wins. You come up with things that we really want to do um, out of uh, theory and out of different white papers. Um, only if you really start conducting the first initiatives, you do understand okay where do I have to put those dots together. Um, and where do I miss out on one of those four different pillars? Um, people, process, technology, and governance, right? And then that kind of an iteration, like going step by step, small steps by small steps, not boiling the ocean, um, where you're capable really to identify the gaps and see where either you can fill um, the gaps or where you have to increase maturity first and train people or increase your uh, tech stack. You know, HelloFresh is an excellent example of a company that is innovating. It was not born in Silicon Valley, which I love. It's a global company. Uh, and, and I got to ask you guys, it seems like it's an amazing place to work. Are you guys hiring? Yes, <laughs> yes. definitely we do. Uh, as, as mentioned, right, this was yes. one of these aspects, distributing and actually we are hiring as an entire company specifically for data. I think there are a lot of open roles. So yes, please visit our, our page from data engineering, data product management, and Clemens has a lot of roles that he can speak about, but yes. Guys, thanks so much for sharing with the CUBE audience, uh, your, your pioneers, and we look forward to collaborations in the future to track progress and really want to thank you for your time.
Thank you very much. Thank Dave. you very much, Dave. And thank you for watching theCUBE's Startup Showcase made possible by AWS. This is Dave Vellante. We'll see you next time.